So in light of that, I thought that I could uh, get no one better than Dr. Strong to join mm -hmm. us as she's an expert in micronutrition and nutrition in general and has a naturopathic approach, obviously, which is tremendously helpful in these cases. Um, she's been an amazing uh, addition to our clinic and has helped us with uh, many patients, both in terms of their nutrition, their diet, exercise regimens, and also in terms of stress relief, which is vastly important. So maybe I'll just have Jen introduce herself a little bit, if you want sure. to talk about yourself. Yeah, so hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Strong. I've been a naturopathic doctor for 13 years now, just started here this last year since February and it's been pretty exciting. Um, my role here is more, um, <clears throat> excuse me, nutrition related. So um, with the patients here, I talk a lot about uh, diet and the importance of certain nutrients, uh, macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, and I also do acupuncture as well around uh, their treatment cycles. Awesome. So I was gonna chat a little bit about the male sperm uh, initially, just in terms of what we assess and then how these nutritional factors uh, can impact things. And then talk about whether or not there is proof and is it fact or fiction that uh, the supplements work. So in general, we're looking at four elements of any semen analysis. So we wanna know number one, how many sperm are there? So we refer to that as the count. And you want a minimum of about 15 million sperm per milliliter of ejaculate. Number two, we want to know how many of the sperm are moving, and that's more commonly referred to as motility. So we want to know how many of the sperm are actually swimming or moving. Number three, we want to know how fast they are moving, and that's referred to as progression. So you can have lots of sperm that are moving but not necessarily have sperm that are moving quickly. They may be just wiggling or staying in one place, but no forward motion. That's obviously gonna need a lot of assistance. And then the last element is called morphology, and that really refers to whether or not the sperm are shaped normally. So if you have abnormally shaped sperm, uh, the theory behind that is that those typically will not fertilize the egg, and therefore you need better quality sperm with less morphological abnormalities in order to do the job. So those are the main four characteristics we look at. Some of the additional factors we look at is how thick is the ejaculate, is it very viscous or non-viscous, and we also look at things like the overall volume, the pH, um, whether or not there are white blood cells indicative of, of infection. But in general, it's those main four ones I mentioned earlier. So with that in mind, what the targets of these sort of supplemental therapies are is to target what's called reactive oxygen species. So it sounds like a big mouthful, but the bottom line is that oxygen can actually be very damaging to you if it's broken up into just a single oxygen mo molecule with an extra electron. That can run around in your body causing a lot of damage. Things that create those molecules are things that typically will cause damage within your body or in influence your immune system. So things like drinking, smoking, drug use, um, probably even exposures to multiple chemicals, a lot of environmental chemicals, BPAs, and so on. So when that occurs, you get damage running through your system, you are influencing the sperm significantly, these are highly sensitive tissues, they're under rapid division, and because of that, even small changes can cause quite a significant effect on the system. So along came scientists who have studied numerous different supplements, and I could sit here probably for half an hour just rhyming off all the different supplements, but the big ones are mainly vitamins like uh, A, C, D, E. Uh, they've looked at things like lycopene, they've looked at uh, L-arginine, N-acetylcysteine, um, zinc is a big one, magnesium. Jen can maybe throw in some extras, I'm, I'm sure I'm missing some there. Um. Yeah, most of them, CoQ10. CoQ10, yep, yep. selenium. Yep. There's Vitamin a bunch, D. yep. Mm -hmm. So all of these can influence things by reducing those reactive oxygen species. And the theory was if you can reduce the reactive oxygen species, can you actually improve the sperm performance? So the answer is there are lots of companies out there that market products which include some or all of these vitamins in them. And because they have these vitamins in them, the theory is they work. The answer is, I'm actually only aware of one study looking at a company's actual product that has demonstrated a benefit. 
And that's an Austrian company that actually produces a sperm supplement that was checked by Health Canada and verified to actually improve sperm parameters. Having said that, there are numerous studies that have looked at either combinations of vitamins or individual supplements or vitamins or adjunct therapies and they have definitely demonstrated significant benefits. Anything from all of those vitamins we mentioned, the supplements we mentioned, they've got proof for things like DHA, which are the omega-3 fatty acids. Zinc is a big one. CoQ10 is a big one for men as well. So we know that these vitamins individually have a benefit. And so we expect that when they're pooled together with other supplements, there certainly wouldn't be anything detrimental. It should be beneficial. So yes, some of these supplements can be expensive, there's no question, but the truth is that they definitely look like they are beneficial and they can provide some assistance to men who are struggling because the sperm performance is suboptimal. We definitely want to recommend, and this is critical, that if you are going to use these supplements, make sure 100% that you are not continuing anything that would be detrimental to your overall health or increasing those reactive oxygen species. So I always liken continuation of smoking or drinking or drug use and taking these vitamins to having a hole in the bottom of a styrofoam cup and trying to fill it. It's basically running out as fast as you can pour it in. That is completely pointless. We have a lot of guys that want to get their sperm to improve but aren't necessarily completely committed to the process or have difficulty quitting some of their habits. And in those circumstances, you're probably wasting a lot of money on those products because you will not be able to undo the damage caused by the, the um, actions you're taking with just taking vitamins. And, and again, Jen might want to jump in there and say something. Yep, yep, so all good nutrients to take. Um, I think it's important to look at the dietary sources of these nutrients as well. So we talked a lot about um, like zinc and selenium. Um, good dietary sources would be uh, nuts and seeds. I always stress the importance of having a good source of, or a good supply of nuts and seeds every day, like a quarter cup to half a cup. Um, CoQ10 can be found in uh, meat products, so just making sure you get enough protein um, a little bit in beans and legumes as well, but mainly from meats. Uh, vitamin D talked about, and that's really important. Hard to get dietary sources from that though. Um, some foods are fortified with it, but there isn't really a good food source naturally, so supplementing is kind of the only way to go with that. Um, another good point would be um, digestion. So it's good to get all those nutrients in, but if you're not digesting really well, then they go in and they go out. So um, making sure you're chewing your foods a lot, um, addressing any digestive issues like heartburn or um, uh, IBS is really important so that you get all the nutrients out of those foods. Are there any detrimental aspects to taking any of these nutrients from the naturopathic perspective? Like too high of a dose? Yeah, too high of a dose or is there any combination that's maybe not <clears throat> optimal? Do you recommend... People take some nutrients in the morning and some at night, for example, oh, or yeah. with or without food. Yeah, so um, not so much with the fertility nutrients. Um, they all kind of, I say play fair. <laughs> they all digest really well together. Okay. <clears throat> um, otherwise, like usually it's like iron and calcium don't go well together, but those aren't usually in those formulas. Okay, perfect. So in terms of fact or fiction, do these supplements work? Uh, almost certainly these supplements tend to work. But it is really important that you are um, living a healthy life to begin with. And it is important that you know the parameters of the sperm to know what we are specifically targeting. Because some of these supplements can uh, improve certain elements of the sperm performance and others can alter other things. So for example, um, CoQ10 is known to improve the uh, number of sperm that are swimming and it's also good for progression of the sperm, the speed of the sperm as I defined earlier but it's not necessarily going to make you make more sperm. So it is, it is really critical to make sure you know what you're trying to target and then make sure you adhere to those important lifestyle habits and dietary habits to ensure that you're doing all of the appropriate things that you can do to improve your overall health and then usually sperm performance will improve with it. Um, do I think you need to spend a ton of money on these products? I don't. So. At least in Canada, we are um, very blessed to have a great Canadian company called YAD. It's Y-A-D. Um, no, I don't own any stock or get anything from them. 
um, as a total uh, disclosure statement, but uh, they're based in Quebec. They make very good products, and it's typically much uh, less expensive than some of the others. The Australian, or sorry, Austrian company I mentioned earlier, uh, their product is called ProFertile, uh, and so they make a really good product as well. And as I mentioned, that's got documented proof from Health Canada that it works. It's a little bit more expensive than the stuff from Yad, um, but uh, it does work very well. And so that's a, a really uh, reasonable thing to, to use. So we've got a question on Facebook, which says, how much iron and calcium should a woman take for fertility and pregnancy? And I will happily defer to the illustrious <laughs> Dr. Strong. Okay, so um, daily sources of iron should include 27 milligrams. Most um, prenatal vitamins have exactly that amount. Um, so that's like the standard amount that's recommended. Some women need more um, if, if their periods were heavy or their levels were low to begin with. Iron deficiency is quite common, so just knowing uh, what your levels are ahead of time is good. Um, and then calcium, don't know the exact number. Um, so we standard. usually recommend about a thousand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we use the same number for iron as long as it's an absorbable iron where you're actually going to get, uh, we typically would say 30 milligrams of elemental iron with good absorption of that iron. Um, a lot of iron products do not absorb easily and certainly many of them have a lot of uh, gastrointestinal side effects. Um, so a lot of companies have moved towards what's called glycosylation of their iron. And so they'll add little bindings of sugar types onto the iron, which can actually significantly improve the uh, ability to tolerate the iron and absorb the iron. I don't know if the ones, um, th is there a particular brand or anything you recommend? Yeah, so I like the NFH brand. It's similar. NFH, I think we did okay. like a comparable with the yep. ad and the NFH. And um, those, that, they're both really good. Um, the NFH one has iron based glycemic form, so okay. it's a well-absorbed form of iron. Um, some of the other ones have like a glycanate form, or a um, gluconate, gluconate yeah, right. which isn't the right. most well-absorbed. Yeah, so some of the cheaper ones for sure are things like ferrous sulfate and ferrous gluconate. Um, you do need to take a lot more of those than you would one of the glycosylated ones. So uh, there are all sorts of different brands and, and certainly cost can be a factor in your insurance coverage as well. Um, but the bottom line is that you got to find something that works for you and that's right for you. Um, and definitely you can bounce it off of myself or Dr. Strong and we would be happy to guide you in terms of what to take. Um, certainly for calcium, a thousand milligrams is very reasonable. And keep in mind that's in someone that's got normal kidney function and also does not have any reason to not take calcium. So, for example, if you have a history of kidney stones, you've got to be careful with your calcium intake. Um, if you've got kidney failure or kidney damage, you're a, a type 1 diabetic, you've experienced some kidney uh, issues before, um, that can alter the recommendations. And so you do need to discuss these with your, your naturopath or your uh, physician to make sure that you are getting the appropriate dose for you. Everything should be individualized um, always, but in particular in infertility, it should always really be individualized. Do you have anything else to add there? Um, no, I think we've covered it. So any questions um, we're willing to take? Fact or fiction, like I said, is these supplements do work. So it's a fact that they are uh, beneficial. Um, it's not fiction and they are worthy of some investment. I don't think you need to go crazy. Um, there are all sorts of things being marketed on the internet. Um, some of them are useful, some of them are not. But uh, I think that it's very reasonable to, to try some of these and, and you will see some benefit from them. Okay, we got another question from Facebook. I'm going to lean forward to read this. I'm showing my age, folks. Um, okay, question about diet. My plan was to gain about five pounds and per Dr. Strong, this one's for you, I added lots of healthy fats into my diet. I noticed I started losing a little bit of my weight. Is it because my body is just... Oh, I gotta see a little bit more here, folks. Sorry. Um, I can't actually see the rest of it. Sorry. Uh, oh, just not used to them. There you go. So that one's for you. All right. So many factors involved in weight loss. Um, usually, with with 
eating um, or adding more fats to your diet, it helps you maintain weight, um, but also depending on what your caloric intake is, um, what your source of other proteins and fats are, it could it could adjust. Um, adding nuts, just looking at adding nuts and not changing anything else shouldn't cause weight loss. Um, so there might be some other things that we can address with that. Um, yeah, yeah, no, mm -hmm. I, I would agree totally. Um, certainly uh, a balanced diet always is, is critical. Um, fats tend to satiate you, meaning that you feel fuller a little bit faster. So a balanced diet with some fat, I think, is, is reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, excessive fats, obviously not. Um, I, I love the idea of nuts. Um, I can't get enough cashews, but you do need to be careful with some nuts because they do contain a lot of fat and cashews in particular can be quite difficult to digest. So, um, you know, again, balanced diet is, is important and um, nuts and seeds are definitely a, a huge part of that. Um, okay, so we have another really good question, which says, um, hi, is NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, safe to take while trying to conceive? And are there any supplements that we recommend for women with PCOS who are trying to conceive naturally? Um, maybe I'll just take that for a second, then we can uh, see what you think as yeah, well. Sure. Yeah. So um, NAC is a great supplement. Um, it does have some evidence for support in fertility and as well in particular for women with endometriosis. So if you're suffering with endo, there are actually studies that have shown some benefit to using NAC. Um, and PCOS women probably will benefit from it as well. Um, in terms of the uh, other supplements for women who have PCOS, um, we use a lot of something called inositol. So inositol has definitely been proven to be beneficial for women who are, um, you know, uh, getting a benefit in terms of uh, wanting to manage their PCOS. And I think we're getting some messages saying our video is paused. I'm not sure, or maybe those are the people who are pausing the video, I'm not sure. In any event, um, if you're using inositol, it will benefit you for sure. Uh, we can't watch your live, it's paused. Oh, why are we paused? Hang on one sec, folks, we're just mm -hmm. trying to get this back. Uh, we're going to come back in one second. We'll just um, come off and go back on again. You want to try that? Or do we have to have everybody rejoin? It's paused. Why is that? There is a problem. It's paused. Huh. Try that. Can you see us now on uh, Instagram, folks? There is a problem. It's just, it's working for me. Yeah, um, the patient that just said it's working for me is on, uh, you guys are on Facebook. It's the Instagram people that are apparently having a problem. Can you see us on fa on Instagram? Uh, let's just pause and go back. Uh, folks, uh, if anyone's watching us, uh, oh, now it says just join. So if you joined us on Instagram, we're just going to sign off for a minute and come right back on. Um, we'll be back in one second. Uh, hang in there. Yeah, it says we are frozen. Oh, no, just leave that one. We'll just keep going. So um, for those of you who are following us on Facebook, just to finish off, uh, we do use inositol quite a bit. We use um, uh, NAC. Uh, all of the vitamins are safe. And for sure, using metformin um, as a not a natural necessarily supplement, but as a medicinal supplement um, has been proven to be beneficial. Uh, Jen may have some uh, information she'd want to add to all of that. Yeah, sure. Um, so NAC... Um, NAC and inositol are kind of the combo that I often recommend for PCOS. Um, NAC is great as uh, mm -hmm. a um, anti-inflammatory and um, helps regulate insulin resistance, which is common for someone to see that with PCOS. Um, there isn't a whole lot of side effects to it, actually, none that I can think of. Um, 
not a whole lot of contraindications either, so it's pretty safe one to take. Um, so we have inositol, NAC, Inoxal. and vitamin D is kind of a, a combo for, for PCOS. Um, okay, folks, we're just trying to get our Instagram live up and running, so uh, uh, we're going to deal with that. We will take some more questions on um, Facebook, so I'm just going to reach in because we missed one. Um, yeah, what kind of folate, folic acid do you recommend for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene defect? Is one milligram of methylated folate enough? Yeah, so... Um... <clears throat> The gene defect is it's a hard thing to test. So um, for those who are struggling with fertility, usually I just recommend going straight to methylfolate to begin with. Uh, one milligram is usually the standard dose that's recommended. Um, and I think it's, that's usually the, well, between 800 micrograms and one milligram usually is what's in a prenatal. So it's a good, a good start. Yeah, um, you can't test for it. Um, it. It's costly because the government doesn't cover it, at least in Ontario. Um, so uh, it does uh, have to have some sort of insurance coverage, but you can test for the gene defect. And um, yeah, I mean, a anywhere from one to five is normally what we would recommend for those patients. So that should be enough. Um, and, uh, and if you have that, we also frequently will check other um, gene defects to look for a thrombophilia. There's a laundry list of them, and I'd probably bore you all to tears if I went through it all, but uh, there are definitely some there that um, uh, that we test for in those circumstances. I think we're back on Instagram now, although um, I'm not seeing any uh, messages from any of the uh, viewers, so we'll just keep going up. I think there was another question here. Um, is inositol something someone with PCOS should take even if not actively trying to conceive um, at this time, but have undergone previous fertility therapy. Um, is that referring to PCOS? Yeah, PCOS? so yeah. someone with okay. PCOS who has previously, um, you know, had trouble or tried to conceive, should they be on it even when they're not trying to conceive? Is it beneficial? Yep. For oh, yeah, for sure. So because it does help um, manage the symptoms of PCOS, um, it's a, a good recommendation to take it. Um, with, with inositol, it's, um, it's helpful for fertility because it helps regulate um, a lot of the symptoms of PCOS, so it's definitely a good idea. Okay. Yeah, and I would agree. I mean, I think in general, anything you can use with PCOS that will help to um, better balance and better control your PCOS is long-term going to be beneficial because there are risks with PCOS that go beyond just the basics of, um, you know, fertility. Uh, irregular cycles over a long period of time can actually uh, contribute to, <clears throat> excuse me, problems with um, things like uh, uh, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, um, endometrial hyperplasia. So um, we are, uh, you know, we are def definitely wanting patients to make sure that they are staying on as much as they can to stay as regular as they can um, throughout their reproductive uh, life. I think we're still having some problem with Instagram. People are still messaging us saying that it's paused. So um, we've got our IT guys on it. I apologize. Um, I think we'll just try and do it from a phone. Um, and maybe that'll solve the problem if we can uh, get it going. Have we got it there? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to replace this guy right here. And well, hi, folks. Sorry for the uh, Instagram glitch. We're not really quite sure what's going on with that. I apologize. Um, we should be live. Oh, yeah, and there we can see the questions again. So there's uh, some sort of glitch with the Instagram, and we apologize for that. But it's good to have you all back. Um, sorry about that before. So we're just going to go to Facebook for a sec while you Instagrammers catch up. Um, I'm taking metformin TID, would inositol be better? Uh, I, I'll defer to you. Usually when you buy it, it comes in a specific um, predetermined dose and that's usually sufficient. Um, the YAD company I mentioned has a product called Inosia, which is inositol and it's got the right amount in that. Um, do you have a specific amount that you recommend or? 
Um, and Ostel, we do four grams, is in a scoop, and that's a, a standard serving. Perfect. Yep. Um, and then someone's asking if metformin is uh, better um, or is inositol better. And I would actually say use both. I don't know how you feel. I don't. Which one? Inositol and metformin. Yeah. Uh, insulin can, sensitizing. There's been agent. studies done on those two used together. Together. Yep. There you go. That's very beneficial. So that's uh, perfectly fine to use that. Okay, so what supplements, this is from Instagram now, what supplements would you recommend for someone with high thyroid antibodies? Um, so I, I know from the medicine side of things, um, we definitely talk to patients about taking selenium um, and calcium and vitamin D. Some of those can have a positive benefit on reducing your thyroid antibodies. Um, I don't know what Jen likes to use. Um, Thyroid's a tricky thing to treat from a natural, a natural perspective. Um, so in my practice, if, if a patient is already on a, a thyroid medication and doing really well with it, we usually have them stick with that because there's very little um, side effects to it. They usually feel so much better once their number, numbers are regulated. Um, selenium's helpful. Um, iodine's helpful in some cases as well. Um, but in terms of therapeutic benefit, usually just the thyroid medication does the trick. Perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, we uh, we typically um, will use those supplements and uh, see if it can bring that down. Um, in general, uh, thyroid antibodies do reflect your body's immune function. And if it's a bit of a more aggressive immune system, then we definitely want to um, try and tame that somewhat. So there can be um, some things that are specific to your thyroid, and then there's just generally decreasing the amount of inflammation in your body, and that can be beneficial too. Um, there's a question here about IVF, so I will touch on that, and not to take away from the supplement questions, but um, so one of our patients has said, how long does it take from start to finish from initial appointment to embryo transfer with PGS testing, that's pre-implantation genetic testing, um, finally got a referral for our clinic. So nervous and excited. So uh, first of all, don't be nervous, um, but totally be excited. <laughs> that's great. Um, we don't want anyone being nervous. We are very calm. Um, we have a really smooth uh, assessment uh, process, and we very much want this to be a very comfortable patient-centered uh, program for you. So there's absolutely no reason to be nervous at all. We talk a lot, we get your story, we get your history, um, we figure out what kind of things we need to test for, and then we test for them when we sit down and line by line go through it in detail with you. Um, I typically will do that first, and then we will almost always refer many of our patients on to Dr. Strong, who collaborates with us and makes the process even better. Um, as far as um, how long it takes, probably on average from your very first appointment to see us, so the time where you would actually be doing IVF would be a couple of months. We never rush into things because we want to make sure that we are doing everything appropriately for you. And we definitely don't want to have a situation where we're rushing you into something and then something is missed and uh, you end up with a suboptimal response, especially when you're doing IVF. Uh, the follow-up to that question is, is it covered, is the genetic testing covered with your first round of IVF through the government? Um, the answer to that is not everybody, unfortunately, on, in Ontario will manage to get an IVF cycle. Um, they only have 5,000 cycles per year. Uh, all of that funding has already been allocated to various centers, and pretty much everyone has some degree of wait list. So um, along with that, uh, the PGT testing is not covered. So your medications are not covered, the PGT testing is not covered, and freezing of your embryos is also not covered. Everything else is covered when you have government funding, but it can take quite some time to get government funding. Um, if you want to take that question right there, um, would you have a plus size woman with unexplained infertility lose weight? before trying any fertility treatments, even IUI, if so, why? And I'll scroll up a little bit here and we can okay. take the next one, yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of fertility, there's a, a good um, percentage chance of getting pregnant when you're in a healthy uh, weight range. So, um, if, if you're starting out overweight, uh, sometimes the chances of getting pregnant are a little bit lower, um, and sometimes the uh, 
the chances of continuing a pregnancy are a little bit lower too. So if you're keen on losing weight for your own health and, and improving your health before getting pregnant to get into a good healthy weight to start with, um, I would encourage that. I think your, your chances of conceiving would be higher and you'll probably enjoy your pregnancy a lot more being at a, at a good healthy weight to begin with. Um, I don't think extreme diets are a good idea, so quick fast weight loss is usually not a good answer um, when you're trying to conceive. So just making good food choices and um, following some good dietary guidelines and supplementing to fill in the gaps is, is probably the best way to go. So um, I'll, I'll just throw in my two cents worth. Uh, I just completed about a seven or eight page document that we will be having on our website and as a brochure very soon. Um, and Dr. Strong and I worked on part of that together. So um, this is directly uh, related to your body mass index and its impact on fertility. Um, we actually now have tried very hard to move away from discussing the impact of this directly with patients in the clinic because it's a very sensitive topic. And we know that a lot of patients struggle with their weight, not because they're doing something wrong, but this is just been a, a lifelong battle for them. And for those patients, we very much uh, respect the fact that it, it can be a struggle and that it's a difficult, difficult one and it's an emotional one as well. Um, so we've put a lot of this into paper format and online and it'll be available to you very, very soon. Our IT guys are on it and I've seen the, the proof it should be up and running very soon. Um, having said that, um, the long and the short of it is that the higher your body mass index, the lower your chances of success and the higher the complication rates, both getting pregnant, staying pregnant, and even after delivery. Um, so it can have a very significant impact on the fertility and on the pregnancy. How much? Um, if your body mass index is quite high, over 40, your chances of success are reduced by up to 80%. If you're doing something simple, for example, IUI with uh, pills, <clears throat> excuse me, your, your baseline chances are only about 10% to 15% to begin with. Reduce that by 80% and now you're down to about 2 to 3%. So sometimes it's not worth doing, especially when there's costs involved um, and an emotional toll as well. And so it can be very useful to lose the weight before you start. But again, everything has to be individualized. If you're 40, telling you to wait six months to a year to lose a considerable amount of weight, um, at least for me, is, is not a reasonable choice. We may have to proceed and do the best we can under the circumstances. So every case has to be taken individually and you have to make a decision for each uh, patient one at a time. Um, okay, I've got a question that says, how do protocols change to hopefully get more mature follicles during egg retrieval while still reducing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? So we're going off of the, <laughs> the beaten path here a bit. Um, so actually in the last few years, there's been a lot of research about triggering patients with something called a GnRH agonist. And this is a, a specific type of hormone that we use which has drastically reduced the incidence of severe um, OHSS, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. You will still get some bloating in certain cases. There can be some discomfort and pain for sure, but the rate of needing hospitalization, drainage of fluid from inside your abdomen, significant pain meds and so on has really gone down. We've also used a lot of adjunct treatments like letrozole, cetratide, which are medications that we can um, try and incorporate right after we've done your egg retrieval, which significantly reduce uh, the incidence of, and the severity of the OHSS. And then we very strongly recommend a high protein diet with lots and lots of uh, sports drinks like Powerade and Gatorade, which can replete, uh, or replenish sorry, some of your electrolytes you lose when you end up getting a lot of uh, fluid in your belly. So all of those can really uh, impact success and, and also reduce the chances. And, and we've done very well. We still have some patients that do still hyperstimulate, but it's way, way less than it used to be. So that's where we've taken it uh, these days. Um, I don't know if you can see that bottom question there, Jen. Um, the, the organic menstrual. Mm -hmm. uh, no, what would oh. you, can, uh, what would contribute oh. to white blood cells showing up on a sperm test? What kind of infections? 
how does this affect sperm performance? You want me to take that? Or? Sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there can be uh, white blood cells on uh, sperm. Um, frequently, it's uh, any kind of prostatic or um, epididymal infection. Um, in many cases, this can be uh, something sexually transmitted, but it doesn't always have to be. Some men harbor infections in their prostate glands and can get prostatitis, and, and that can actually cause some white blood cells to show up there. So um, we can do sperm cultures. We can determine if there is, um, you know, any problems with the uh, the ejaculate in terms of an actual bacterial infection, and certainly we treat those. Um, the one important thing to take note of is that uh, you do need someone very good doing semen analysis, which is why we recommend it always be done in a fertility center, never at just the local lab, um, because white blood cells can actually look a lot like immature sperm cells and vice versa, and you need to know which is which. So make sure you're getting it done with us, um, or at your for local fertility center, don't just do it at a lab. Um, I, I'm just seeing again on Facebook the question of how long it takes. It's usually going to be a couple of months. I think I mentioned that earlier to go from your initial visit with us to actually doing, um, you know, an embryo transfer. Because as I mentioned, we don't want to miss anything. We want to make sure we're doing everything correctly. So there's a question about using organic menstrual care products. I'll take that one. Sure, yeah, for sure. Um, so definitely a benefit to using um, organic ones. Uh, the standard ones uh, contain bleach and that's not um, a great uh, chemical to introduce to the vaginal area. So where you can, um, pick up some organic uh, tampons and pads uh, to prevent the exposure of bleach. Okay, so I never knew that. So you're <laughs> saying that the Kotex and the yes. Stay Free and all those mm -hmm. other ones all have uh, bleach in them, or some of them have bleach mm -hmm. in them. Yep, that's how they're white. And where do you find and organic um, pads and tampons? So uh, the health store will have them. Oh, okay. And uh, Zayers has that, you know, that natural section where yep. they have like organic canned goods and cereals. They also have organic um, menstrual products. Oh, great. Yep. And then there's the Diva Cup. And which then there's the Diva idea. Cup, which lots of people like as well. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we may have missed. Oh, there's one there. Are there foods that are better to eat in order to assure a good egg each month and others to avoid? So that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So with foods, there, there isn't really one super awesome food that does the trick, but just a good diet, high in antioxidants. We always stress the importance of antioxidants um, when trying to conceive. Um, so having a diet full of lots of fruits and veggies, um, like half your plate fruits and veggies, actually Kim's food guide is quite different now. That's um, the new guidelines is half your plates, fruits and veggies, and that'll give you a good amount of antioxidants to help with egg quality. Um, and then the good fats that we talked about from nuts and seeds, uh, good protein sources. Um, that pretty much covers it. Um, okay, yeah, and I, I would uh, echo all of those sentiments. I think um, all of those are important. Uh, a balanced mm -hmm. diet, lots of antioxidants, lots of uh, vitamin-rich foods. Um, those will all be uh, helpful towards, um, uh, you know, helping you conceive. Yep. Um, oh, and others to avoid. So there was um, some studies done on, on, like we all know, alcohol and caffeine are not uh, good ideas to have in large amounts. Um, there are some studies done and having more than uh, two cups of coffee a day, so 250 milligrams of caffeine, can lower both egg and sperm. Quality. Yeah, um, typically one cup a day is the maximum we recommend, and, and especially for pregnant patients, uh, more than one cup a day has been associated with miscarriage, so we definitely don't recommend more than that. Um, there is a question about hydrosalpinx, and um, I promised I would answer this, so I will. Uh, okay, so for those of you that are not aware, hydrosalpinx is when your fallopian tubes are very swollen and filled with fluid, which is where the word hydro comes from, and salpinges is the uh, uh, Greek term for fallopian tube. Um, so the question is, is there a benefit to keeping your fallopian tubes or should they be removed? So there was actually a study done uh, some years ago which showed that removing hydrosalpinx uh, resulted in a 50% improvement in your success rate for IVF. 
So there is no question that if you have hydrosalpings, they absolutely should be removed. Now they don't need to be removed before egg retrieval, as long as you're doing a frozen embryo transfer. Um, if you're doing a frozen embryo transfer, you can get your fallopian tubes removed after, but there's no question that they need to be removed before you do the, uh, the embryo transfer because inside the tube is a huge number of immune mediated cells. And these cells are what are actually causing the fluid buildup. That fluid, because it's got so many cytokines, immune cells, natural killer cells, macrophages, it actually will um, cause a death of the embryo. They actually directly attack the embryos. So you definitely want to remove your fallopian tubes before you try getting uh, pregnant. There's no question. Um, someone's asking about when would you use and not use red raspberry leaf tea? So, um, red raspberry leaf tea is often recommended at um, the end of, in your third trimester, at the end of pregnancy. It's a great uterine tonic, so it won't start contractions, but once contractions start, it helps strengthen them so they're more productive. Um, I know there's there's some um, discussion about using it um, before pregnancy to help the egg and plant. Um, I don't usually recommend it because, again, with it being a tonic, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, but I know some people do use it for that purpose. Um, it also helps with nausea, too. So for those who have nausea continued throughout pregnancy, taking it in the last trimester is perfectly safe. Okay. Um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend taking anything that causes contractions earlier. But if it's near the end of the pregnancy, that really shouldn't be a problem. Um, especially if you're past sort of 36, 37 weeks, the, that, that kind of mark is probably safe for the baby. Uh, we've got an Instagram uh, question saying, can my pregnancy symptoms come and go? I read that uh, your breast tenderness goes away, if your breast tenderness goes away, you may be experiencing a, a missed abortion or a missed uh, miscarriage. So um, pregnancy symptoms really are not reliable indicators of uh, anything, to be honest with you. The reality is that every woman's body is so different and the hormones associated with your pregnancy are so different. There's no consistent sort of uh, approach to this where you can say that one patient is going to have, um, or I should say all patients are going to have the, the same experiences. So certainly if your symptoms all of a sudden uh, go away, and all of your symptoms disappear. Uh, I won't say that I wouldn't be concerned, I would be, but that's certainly not proof that you have had a miscarriage and we would never rely on symptoms to be able to determine that. So if you're concerned, we are 100% here for you. The way to figure it out is either through blood work with uh, beta HCG levels done 48 hours apart because they should rise by 60%, or by doing an ultrasound to verify that everything is okay. You're still seeing a heartbeat in the fetus. And that can pretty much be seen um, with a really good ultrasound anytime after about five weeks and six days, five weeks and five days, um, with most ultrasounds later into the sixth week. Uh, so for sure, if you're concerned, um, just see your doctor immediately and we will arrange to, to verify that for you. Um, there's another question. Once you're done having kids, what are the pros and cons of tying tubes versus tubal ligation? Um, okay, not sure I understand that because tying your tubes in a tubal ligation are actually the same thing. Maybe you, remo you mean removing tubes versus tying your tubes. Um, it's a theoretical benefit to removing your tubes. And that theoretical benefit is that uh, most people now believe that uh, ovarian cancer actually begins in your fallopian tubes. And so by removing the fallopian tubes, you actually do reduce the chances of, of ovarian cancer. And that's actually been proven um, in that women that don't have fallopian tubes have a lower incidence of ovarian cancer. So these days when someone is 1 billion percent sure that they no longer want any children, we will actually encourage them to remove their tubes rather than uh, just tie them. Um, for me, I typically will try and uh, convince my patients not to tie or remove them if you're younger than 35, because as a fertility specialist, I frequently see the patients after uh, they've decided to tie them at whatever age they were, 26, 27, 
you know, even early 30s, and they're in our office now because they need fertility therapy because their tubes are tied and they've either found a new partner or their life circumstances change somehow and they want another child. So I typically recommend that patients that are younger uh, or at least less than 35 not tie their tubes. Um, there are many other options that you can explore uh, that are equally or even more effective than tying your tubes and have even less side effects in some circumstances. So um, if you're over 35, for sure we can talk about the options. If you're younger, I don't recommend it. Um, okay. <laughs> Is having a tilted uterus a real condition? If so, how can it be diagnosed? Um, okay, so is it a real condition? No, it actually has no impact on fertility. That's been uh, proven many times. Um, how can it be diagnosed? Uh, it can be diagnosed with an ultrasound. Um, it's very easy to diagnose. It literally would take about five seconds. Uh, the only thing it does impact from a fertility perspective is that many women who have uh, a tilted uterus or a, a what we call retroverted retroflex uterus will actually have a considerable amount of pain with intercourse. And if you're having pain with intercourse, you're probably having way less intercourse. So uh, that can certainly affect your fertility. But aside from that, there is no impact on the actual fertility itself. What's the next question? How does the wait list work for the free IVF cycle covered under the government after three failed IUI treatments? Okay, so um, the government kind of unleashed this program on us with no guidance as to um, how to implement the program. So every clinic has their own set of rules, regulations. Um, some people are doing a lottery, some people are doing a wait list. I know for a fact that some clinics are cherry picking the patients. Uh, on our recent phone call, we had a conference call with the ministry. The ministry actually said that they are considering even making the allocation of the funding dependent on the success of the clinic. Um, let me explain what that means for everybody. If success of the clinic is going to determine our success rates, all clinics are going to end up having to, uh, or not our success rates, I should say, our funding allocation, all clinics are going to start cherry picking patients, um, which we have never done. Um, I've tried very strenuously to avoid any of that, and I personally actually have nothing to do with our funding allocation because I wanted to be neutral of it. It's run by our nurses and they uh, are doing it on a, on a waitlist system. Um, in our program, in order to cut down what was initially an over three year waitlist, we decided to implement a three IUI first program for people that qualified for a reasonable chance at IUI. And after that, we put you into the waitlist. So that's how it works. There is no special criteria. It doesn't matter um, whether you're older or younger or what your you know body mass index is, as long as it's under 40, which is a regulation. Um, because we can't do IVF on patients with a body mass index over 40. Um, and we, of course, are quite strict about things like smoking and drug use, but there's no governmental restriction um, or guidance whatsoever. So any clinic can come up with their own protocol uh, and their own sort of allocation system, and that's legitimate for that clinic as long as the ministry doesn't oppose it in any way. It has to be fair and evenly distributed, and we, we've tried to do that with every single couple or patient that's come through. I'm just going to scroll up a little. I'm not sure if we're catching everything here. Yep, there you go. So there's a <clears> question <throat> about benefit of uh, women's fertility with CoQ10 and the dosage of vitamin D. So um, definitely a benefit in taking CoQ10. Um, I think the biggest benefit with CoQ10 is um, for women who are um, a little bit older and trying to conceive. CoQ10 is a great antioxidant, um, helps keep the eggs young and healthy. So um, dosing CoQ10 um, at an early, uh, older age is a good idea. Um, I usually dose it around two to three hundred. I know you like it a little higher. Uh, yeah, so CoQ10 is horribly poorly absorbed. Um, so uh, you need to actually take quite a bit to get enough CoQ10, but I think it depends on which formulation you're using mm -hmm. as well. 
Um, there's, I know one product from a company that we used to use, uh, which um, had very, very good absorption. So you only needed 125 milligrams, and that was equivalent to 600 milligrams from another company. Um, the problem was it was so potent, all our patients ended up getting rashes, so we stopped using it. Um, but yeah, it does depend on how you're taking it, what the formulation is, and it also depends on whether it's ubiquinone or ubiquinol. So there's, there's right. differences there as well. And then the vitamin D. So um, vitamin D is um, a little controversial too. I think everyone's got a bit, bit of a different dose for that. Uh, or typically, uh, vitamin D dosing is at 1,000 if your levels are awesome. Um, most people don't have really good levels of vitamin D. And then when we're working with um, trying to conceive, often those who are struggling to conceive, their vitamin D levels are even lower. So um, 1,000 is good if, if you're... Uh, levels are good just as a maintenance because again you don't get it a lot from foods and um, if your levels are low it just depends on what your level is at so uh, typically um, we'll dose it anywhere between uh, 2,000 to 6,000 a day um, usually for about six months or so and then retest it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I typically will t uh, titrate. So um, there's a, a great uh, vitamin D formulation we use, which is 2000. I don't think you can overdo it. There is um, an overwhelming amount of data now demonstrating that if you do not have sufficient vitamin D levels, uh, that your fertility is actually compromised. In it. And in fact, there's now data on miscarriage as well. So we strongly encourage patients to take uh, a fair amount of vitamin D. Um, there's a real easy question here, which is how long does it take for the vitamins to impact sperm? Roughly about three months. Um, so the reason for that is that uh, new sperm is produced um, uh, today, and then you'll ejaculate that sperm that you start producing today in about three months. So anything you do today, you'll see the benefit of in three months. There are some subtle exceptions to that. So for example, motility can be improved, um, progression can be improved even in a shorter time period, but morphology, which is the shape of the sperm, that's the production of new sperm. So that requires new sperm um, to go through the whole maturation process. Same thing with the count. So you can change motility in a shorter time frame, but you can't change the number of sperm or the uh, morphology of the sperm. Um, Oh, there's a good one. Okay. Also wondering how long do women uh, need to take their CoQ10, vitamin D, etc. I know CoQ10, it's quite a long time. There are studies that actually showed it takes six months to see a benefit. I don't know about the um, vitamin D. I would think it's fairly instantaneous. Do they need to take vitamins? I think it depends on the purpose too. Um, like if you're taking CoQ10 to conceive and then you conceive, you don't really need it after that yeah um and then the vitamin d if your levels are are low you want to get them up and then once they're up then you usually like do a maintenance dose pretty much lifelong yeah yeah for sure absolutely i agree with that um there's a great question and i'm going to take this because this is really fun for me um it's a question about is there a website you recommend for pelvic floor exercises or a physical therapist in the area you would recommend for endometriosis pain management um, so pelvic floor exercises are not going to have an impact on um, endometriosis pain management in many patients. It may benefit some, um, and there are some studies that have looked at this, but strictly strengthening your pelvic floor will not necessarily help with endometriosis symptoms. Um, Physiotherapy in terms of massage and so on can help release some pressure points um, and sensitive points. And Dr. Strong does a fair bit of acupuncture and I believe there is some data mm -hmm. on that being beneficial. Um, but not so much for physiotherapy. I believe there is someone that started doing pelvic physiotherapy in um, the Windsor area. I, I honestly don't uh, um, you know, have referrals there, so I, I couldn't really tell you, but I'm sure you can find it if you look it up online. Um, how, how much do you do in terms of acupuncture and so on? Uh, for endometriosis? Yeah. Yeah, definitely beneficial for, for pain management. Um, and then there's uh, like supplements that help as well and, right. and home treatments like uh, castor oil packs that are really helpful too. Um, I think pelvic floor physio is great for post-pregnancy. Right. 
Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Post-pregnancy, if you uh, have the chance to jump on YouTube and you type in vaginal weightlifting, (laughs) you will see um, this uh, clip for a woman that looks like she's in a suit, but she's wearing shorts. And I think it's like a pomegranate that is dangling between her legs. Um, Her name is Kim Anami, A-N-A-M-I. And she has an incredible program on how to uh, do uh, pelvic floor strengthening. And I recommend that to everybody. She's awesome and what she says actually works. So that's the best way to do it. Uh, Just going to scroll through and see if there's some more questions. We love you too. Um, I had a third degree episiotomy that tore with my first nine months ago. I'm still experiencing discomfort. Would you recommend me to see anyone before trying to get pregnant again? Um, you want me to take this one, I'm assuming. Sure. <laughs> uh, okay, so third degree tear, I'm very sorry. Um, definitely very sore and can cause a lot of um, stress and strain uh, personally and in a relationship as well. Um, if you look at the American literature on this, it actually suggests that you not deliver vaginally again. I think, again, it needs to be individualized. If you had a really large uh, first infant, like an eight and a half, nine pounder, um, I would definitely recommend that you discuss that with your obstetrician um, or midwife and talk about an elective cesarean section, which is the recommendation for women that have had third and fourth degree tears. Um, certainly, if you've had a fourth degree Um, almost everybody will tell you you should probably have a cesarean section because a second fourth degree tear can leave you with rectal incontinence, which means you will not be able to control either your gas or your stool. And obviously that's a lifelong problem no one wants to have. Um, A third degree, we're probably going to give you a little bit more leeway, but I would most certainly recommend that you consider um, minimizing any potential trauma. So those are cases where we want to measure the size of the baby, um, make sure we monitor your weight gain during the pregnancy, uh, you know, try and do our best to ensure that the baby is not going to be um, excessively large and cause that kind of trauma again. And for sure, if it was a situation where you needed forceps again or something like that, I would probably discourage most patients from engaging in that. I'd probably say, again, a cesarean section is safer. Um, In terms of physio uh, or uh, treatment of the pelvis after you've had that, um, I think that's a reasonable option. Um, It depends on what the problem is. There are a lot of women that will have cysts under the tissue, um, and those can be dealt with surgically, and they're very easy to deal with. There are some women that will form little microfistulas, and those can also uh, cause a lot of problem. We get patients that have something called granulation tissue, and then a lot of women, I notice, have their vaginal uh, introidal muscles, which are the, the muscles sort of just at the entry, right at the uh, sides of the vagina, and those can actually be in spasm, and I find that um, just using any kind of massage therapy frequently with just even a vibrator will actually relax those muscles and relieve a lot of that pain and tension. So hopefully that that helps you with that question. Just going to scroll up, guys. Sorry for leaning into the screen. Um, Okay. Agree. Always awesome. Thank you. Oh, okay. (laughs) All right, great. We're getting lots of agreement. I think we're going to wind it down just because we're past eight, but... When embryos are frozen in pairs, do they have to be transferred as a pair or can they be separate? Um, Okay, I guess that's a me question. Mm -hmm. So um, they don't have to be transferred. They can be uh, frozen separately, Uh, or sorry, they can be uh, refrozen. Um, But we usually freeze them in pairs when we think that they need to be frozen in pairs um, to optimize chances. So we would normally under those circumstances recommend you transfer them as a pair. Um, The data looking at uh, retransferring embryos or or transferring embryos that have been frozen, thawed, refrozen, and thawed again um, does demonstrate that there's some compromise, but when you talk to the experts, they all say that it actually still works quite well. Um, In our program, we haven't had to do it too many times, but the few times that we've done it, it's really been kind of 50-50, so I'm not really uh, prepared to make a definitive statement on that uh, with us. But if you look at the research, um, they say that it's safe and it can be done. So um, this is frequently done for embryos where we couldn't determine if they were genetically normal on a first biopsy and it needs to be done again. Um, Okay, anything else down there? I think we have hit the bottom. Um, 
Oh, someone just uh, joined us now. So I think we're going to wind it down. It's just past eight o'clock. Um, we uh, really, at least for me, I really want to thank everybody for joining. And I absolutely want to thank Dr. Strong for joining me. An awesome addition. We will definitely have her back. Um, we love the fact that you guys uh, watch this and uh, have joined us. Uh, again, we really want to grow this and uh, try and get it out to as many patients as possible to help everyone. So uh, share this with everyone. Definitely comment. Um, let us know what else we can do to improve this for you guys. And um, we will definitely listen to those comments. Uh, share, like uh, as much as possible. And we love the feedback. So let us know what we can do better. Uh, have a great evening, guys. We will do this again most likely next Monday. Thanks again to Tarek Ibrahim who uh, set this all up and uh, we'll undoubtedly have a chat with Instagram and figure out why it uh, went haywire at the beginning. So sorry for that, guys. Uh, love you all. Have a great day. And Jen, uh, any any final statements? Anything you want to no, leave everyone? No, I think that's a wrap. Awesome. That's a wrap, guys. Have a great night. Take care. Someone had just said, I'd like to see more topics on, and then I didn't see it. Did you see that? It should be there and watch it again. On Instagram? Like, on Facebook, I mean? Uh, like, yeah, on like if Facebook. we go to that last second, it should.